Hello, John. Thank you for coming back to the channel. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, so uh, a lot has happened in the news, but before we start uh, talking about uh, current events and your perspective on things, I just want to remind the audience that in the description of every video that I've been doing with John, there is a link to his website. So please click that link and that will take you to his website and you'll be able to sign up for his periodicals and also sign up for a reading. So uh, we'll go into a little bit more detail about what a reading is later in the show, but uh, please click the link, sign up for his periodical and uh, take a look at his, uh, his books that he, you know, he, he's written over 50 books. So please uh, purchase the books and uh, help John out. So thank you again for coming to the channel and uh, how you doing, John? Oh, I'm doing good. And I just, before I forget about it, you know, if, if you just, if people just go to amazon.com and type in John Hogue, H-O-G-U-E, um, and then you get, just click on my author's link and you'll see a good, uh, not all of them, but you'll see a lot of the books that I've written and you can kind of check them out and see if you're interested in buying them as a, as a printed book or an ebook. Great. Great. Do you think that more people are doing the ebook or doing the, the printed books lately? I think, uh, more people actually do the ebooks. Um, really? Yeah, so but, I had this, I had but, this thought but I'm getting more are, and more yeah. people uh, going back to uh, print, you know. I have this feeling that people are moving more back to the print. Yeah. There was this time period about five years ago, everyone wanted an ebook, ebook, ebook. Yeah. But then all of a sudden that people are like going, they like the feel of a yeah. book, you know, or they can, oh, you know, books, and there's you the know. aesthetic. The right. Back you know, here, you the kind of see them in the back there. There's a whole bunch of them. Uh, that's yeah. only like half. Uh, and they, they have very beautiful covers. I just yeah. did a whole, I did five new covers at the beginning of this month, uh, with my designer and, uh, getting ready for the Nostradamus project. And, and the, the book that a lot of people have been waiting for, for years, uh, has finally got its last title. It's not the roaring 2020s anymore. It's called the book of things to come. And it goes 4,000 years into the future from main essay themes of main interests of topics of where we're going with politics, with love, with war, with genetics, with reincarnation, with all that. And uh, and just and space faring and all of that UFOs and just takes it in deep into the well, it takes you through the age of Capricorn, which is the great age after the age of Aquarius, where humanity is supposed to transcend um, it's symbolized actually in the Capricorn is the high peak of the mountain, which means the Everest of the earth element. So it's the last time earth uh, is, is um, an age in, in this grand cycle of things. So it's literally, uh, you know, that potentially means that the high peak, it's like you climb to the Everest of consciousness in, in the next, you know, 4,080 to 6,080 and where human beings actually transcend their physical nature, and even time itself. And I kind of, in one of, <laughs> unexpectedly in my Earth Trauma Report for this new bunch of articles that I put out uh, just now, um, and or my website updating all the samples, I just did that a few hours ago, so it's all fresh in there for everybody to sample. But I was just, it happens sometimes in medium work, you're going in a certain way. Well, it happens in our shows. We're going one direction. And suddenly I started writing the kind of narratives kind of unstuck in time that, because triggered by the age of Capricorn idea about the possibility of a lot of the solutions that are, that are um, maybe going to happen at the last minute, we don't kind of cross over this and cross over that and end ourselves because perhaps at some point in the timeline, as we see it as human beings, is a linear timeline. Um, the the people of the future were also living that at a certain point collectively um, became unstuck in time. And therefore, I mean, I've I've had, I've, I don't know if I've talked on our show, I, I think I've done before years ago, but I had a Satori when I was 21 and the Satorian Zen is like a glimpse of light of the of the truth enlightenment. It was just a very, very powerful experience where I was. Uh, I think what happened was I went into the Akashic Records, um, 
And uh, something parallel to that is, um, well, you notice in in uh, in the trilogy on Neo and the Matrix, um, there's the wonderful scene where he meets the architect. I think it's in the second second movie. And I was thinking that whole area is surrounded by television sets that are like in a huge spherical, this endless television sets. Um, what I experienced was was remotely like that but i was thinking boy the wachowskis might have had something going on there because what i i ended up finding myself in this, this position where my my visual sight was completely off what is humanly possible i was literally as if a sphere's surface could be all eyes and i essence it is seeing everything behind up and down and all around in a huge spherical space of seeing and the uh and in the center was me witnessing the seeing and around me were infinite infinite not so not just tv sets but so, I, I can't even explain how it's like how does an aurora float and it's like this and then time seems to have stopped and now it's like that and you're like going, I don't, there's no like thread to how it's suddenly doing this over here when it was there. And so this quality around each framing in a strange darkness were these opens, these apertures, and they were infinite, uh, uncountable. And they were all, um, and it was literally, I, I could bring words to it now, it's, it's something Nostradamus, when he would try to talk about his um, his channeling, because he's mainly a channeler, um, and I have to apologize for people because people took up my talking about his water gazing in the early part of my career, and then unfortunately I was not aware how Hollywood can then turn that into that's how he did it all the time, even though I said he did other things. So, um, but actually, what he was was a channeler of of spirits from the low daemon to the astral and the you know the um the limbo areas you know um the this plane and the in, in between period to the second plane third fourth fifth and he he used angels of fire more than the other elements or archerons you know kind of superhero type things and but the seventh was the godhead the divine plane and in, in that plane, there's um, the past, the present, and the future all meet, and all happening simultaneously, uh, and all of their possibilities, and all the things we've ever thought or made or created, all the music we've created, and not just us, but all infinite worlds, and all the things that they have done, all the memories are in the akasha which is uh, is a sanskrit word for sky uh the that's what the akashic records mean it's the record library of the heavens and the celestial library and it is it is um so all of this was happening all around me because I, what had happened is I was involved very much this was before I was a sannyas and, and that, but it kind of led me four years later to going to India and all. But what 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 happened is I was in the Robert Monroe's Institute, uh, one of his sixty thousand people in the Gateway program, where he was just trying to get people to use his his Theta Wave thirty two track tapes. It was taking amazing work because he was sound. He was a sound person in, in radio and all. He, it was amazing what he did because what he did is he he came to understand that that people that are in deep meditation seem to be in a theta wavelength. Their brain goes into theta. So he was thinking, well, can we just use our modern technology to lay somebody down and and, and breathe and wear the earphones and actually create the theta wave? And in a way, I think he did. And and then once you have the knack, I would add, he didn't do this because he was still relying on the tapes. But what came on for me is that once you get the lead to how to do it, 
you might call this the you know they've, they've said how some people had used drugs to and even in ancient times in the sanskrit periods the soma is used to give a glimpse of the work that you do with your own being it's a little artificial glimpse just like people have had a lot of awakenings with what my master osho used to say was the very violent uh way which is lsd which kind of forces it on you um and uh but all the same a lot of people started terence mckenna a lot of other people started their path uh because they'd had a glimpse uh through through a, a soma like event well Robert Monroe was doing with the theta waves and tape it gave me a taste of how to relax myself into theta. And so I was doing a 10, I was doing Zen breathing meditations, first real serious meditations that I did in my life. I'm 21. I'm, I'm sitting in my bed in the corner, breathing in 10 and then holding and breathing out. And at a certain point after doing it for a few weeks, I, I suddenly felt incredibly heavy, like tired, but like I was led. And, and I, and it got so bad that I had to stop meditation and I somehow managed to get up and I literally like fainted on my bed, fully clothed with my shoes on. And I just went flunk into the bed. And at a certain point, I'm in that kind of borderline between waking and sleeping and where things, the rules of this dream start to fade into the dream dream. Um, and I, I had this awareness as, oh, I should have taken off my shoes before I got into bed there. And I, and I was looking and saying there, he's, he, I've got my shoes and I, I was not kind of aware that I was looking, hovering over myself and saying, well, that's how I saw it. I said, but wait a minute, how am I able to see my shoes? Because I'm laying down there, which I was equally feeling. And then I, then it dawned on me that, oh my God, this is a, this is the most conscious I've ever been in a astral projection ever. You know, I am like in it. And then what happened was that, I mean, some people have heard this story, but many new people haven't. So I'll tell it again, even though it's been years. Um, what then happened was I found my consciousness, my witness becoming some kind of thing that was floating in the corner of the bedroom up near up near the um, ceiling, like over there, and looking kind of down in this kind of widened look of me down, seems much farther than normal, down there in the bed, laying, laying there. Uh, and I uh, started to hear distant, um, a dis all around me was a distant sound of something like a waterfall made of human voices, infinite voices. Oh, but it was but it was like waterfalls all around me and then then i began to this spherical sight started happening where my consciousness began to expand and start taking in everything that was all around it 360 all this way and all around and and then whatever i touch and then suddenly i'm like i'm getting bigger and bigger where the world is going away and it's, i'm in space and i'm around planets and and whenever i touched a star or a planet i became one with it and and at a certain point because we're not in time linear anymore everything began to happen at once where i was now in the center of and i was invisible but i was there witnessing in the center all these infinite possibilities and memories, like this, a, a great hall that was circular, like a sphere of infinite, like up there and then bigger and bigger, 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 and then down, 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 down. And, and all of them were playing. All of them were playing their stories out at once. And I could be here in the no time of it. And if I wanted to be in one of those windows, I was there for a million years. And, but when I came back out, it was just like nothing. But when I was in it, 
it was a million years. I was like sitting for a million years and then <laughs> coming out. And uh, so then, then the, the voices changed. Something was wrong. And so I started looking around for that little window of this little person sleeping in his bed somewhere, which was me. I got to that place back in the bedroom and he was now laying on his back in bed uh with the covers over and he and his face was very pale and i was worried that something happened and so i i made i had made not so consciously as i've done in other astral projections even ron monroe would talk about the more you try to get back into the body the effort is actually you have to do the opposite you have to let it all go so I, I, if you can imagine, if you have a consciousness inside you and you start squeezing it like your bicep, I was like, going, mm, mm, you know, trying to get back in, doing the, doing the wiggle your toes, wiggle your toes. That was one of, one of his ways. Um, but the toes were, I was, they're just, nothing was moving. And he was like, and so I, then I couldn't get in. So I just was hovering there and I went, I've died. Because they looked dead, it was pale, and I said, "I've died. I something happened, and I died in my astral projection." I, it, strangely enough, I wasn't feeling. Oh my God! Was it was more like suchness. Such is the case. What else? Uh, what, you can. It's like all those identifications of why me or why I have all these plans that was irrelevant to what I had just seen in the Akasha. Uh, and so I just, I was there with it. It was like suchness, such is the case that I'm dead and all whining and crying about it is really irrelevant because I'm dead. But there's an awakening too because I was watching it. So what I simply did was I just let it go. I said, well, I obviously can't do anything. I'm dead. And so I let it go. And then this thing in the, up in the ceiling that was this witness of all this, it started to get heavy and heavy. And it started to sink like a balloon that was losing its hot air, you know, so it couldn't float anymore. It was like grounding, grounding. So it passed through the carpet. And I had this amazing experience when that started happening of seeing things absolutely solid as we see everything. But equally, I was seeing absolutely everything from the inside, too. So, I mean, it wasn't just carpet, it's carpet. And I, I was in the boards of the, the, the trailer that I lived in, the double wide in San Pedro, California. I was, I was floating, and as I was going down, I was floating into the basement area where all the sandstone, sandy earth of San Pedro, of Los Angeles area was there. And then, and then it started to curl and then come up back towards the floor. And then I was seeing myself coming through the boards again. And I was, uh, and everything was getting bigger and bigger. And I could see my head coming in a forest of bed springs. And the bed springs were like, oh. and I was getting very small, the perception to where my head looked like a planet that I was coming in like a spaceship to. It was that vast. And I was heading right for the nape of my neck, right there. And it was like, oh. The nape was like gigantic, gigantic, gigantic. And then the moment I touched it, everything changed. Immediately, I was in the dimensions of a cold body. And it was as if somebody had grabbed me by the head and gone whack. And the, with the feet going whack. Like I, I came in very violently. The whole, it was like somebody held my head and, and whipped my body like a wet towel. Whack. And it hurt. And I was laying there and I, I could feel the mass of my body, but I could not. Feel, I had a pain in the nape of my neck and I thought, oh my God, I've come in too so hard, I broke my neck. And now I'm, there, again, I was, uh, I'm back. 
I can't really see. I am. I keep my eyes closed. I'm. I'm still kind of feeling this weird of the voices, and and I'm laying there, and it's just uh, I'm. I broke my neck. I can't. I can't move anything. So I just was there with it. There's just no. When something like that's happened, there's no time to waste on your pinianic little mind and all the things that it's been taught because it's, a, it's not relevant when you're in such an experience. It's just a dream. So, so I waited. Well, I, had, I was just, just there. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't call out for help or anything. I was just there. So I laid there. And in the span of about 20 to 30 minutes in normal time, slowly, slowly, I started to feel my body come back from, from the top down. It slowly, slowly. And when it got to where I could feel my hands, I was so happy and grateful because it, well, at least I'm not a quadriplegic. I can, I can use my hands. I can create I can write, I can do things, I could sing, my throat was back. Um, and then very slowly, it got all the way eventually back to my toes. And I could feel myself in, but it was literally, I was, the astral part of me was very, not quite integrated into the body, to where I really was uh, <laughs> a little stuck out of it. So, um, so what I did then is what Monrona taught us is when you come in hard, um, I laid over on my left side and tucked the pillows and, and watched and let myself doze asleep so that the body could come out and come back in the right way and adjust. So, so that happened. I woke up 20 minutes later and I have never been the same since I, I have eyes behind me, below me, you know, I can see out the bottom of my souls if I want to. <laughs> it's it's I've not been the same since. And so the other thing that then happened is that uh, let's see. I then went to India and was initiated by Osho as a sannyasin uh, disciple, Swami Dion Arjuna. Eventually, my name was although it was first Dion John. But eventually he said, he, I always felt he had a, quite a name for me, but I was afraid of it. But then if one, and on the ranch, I, it was this one day where I wrote him and I said, I, I finally made peace and made friends with John. And it's been a lovely 18 months. Now I am, and the, the, one of the most beautiful things about when things are really lived totally is one moment they, they're freed. You know, so many, many people hold on to things because they haven't lived them. They haven't burned it at both ends. Or they haven't just... And it was amazing to experience how my identity of that name, all it needed was a few months of just being a friend of this John fellow. And then I said, I'm ready for the new name. And when two days later, he wrote back and he signed it and gave me the letter. And he gave me the name Swami Dion Arjuna, which is a like being called in Sanskrit, John Wayne. <laughs> you know, like, well, I'll tell you a little band of us, when we go out on a battlefield of truth, I've got a king that's guiding my chariot as Lord Krishna, but... I'm kind of feeling a little weird about killing all these people on the other side who I have. If they want the crown, they can have it, pilgrim. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, he breaks down on the battlefield and Krishna, the two armies are waiting to fight this huge battle, which is the Mahabharata, the great Indian war. And it's in the Bhagavad Gita. It's a little chapter in this huge, literally it's this thick <laughs> of all the volumes of the stories in it. And, so Arjuna was given the crown, but um, all these other people wanted it. And a lot of them were people he loved, including Dronacharya, his, his teacher, the one who taught him how to be this incredible archer. And, and they're all over there. And, and it's like, so Krishna convinces him of, a, you know, Bhagavad Gita is kind of a, a, a treatise and of debate on transmorality. That is, you know, a, a reality that's beyond the normal concepts of good and evil. 
and where killing sometimes is good, you know, and peace is evil. Things get a little mixed up. Now, Arjuna debated with him all the way through and uh, and kept questioning him, questioning him. And, but the interesting thing that the first impression deeply that I had about when he gave him that name was not about all the war and Arjuna and all of that. Or a few days later when I got my new job, which was as a pest controller of the Oregon commune. <laughs> and, you know, I, I had this really... Um, we were first a team, then I was alone for the next two years. But I had um, Ravi Das uh, was my uh, work with me, and he his his father was a like nuclear scientist, and he was a really brilliant guy. And so so we got we we all had our handles because we all used uh, um, um, radios, and a lot of the a lot of the we found a lot of the bars all around uh, Oregon used to listen to us because we were really quite entertaining. And to give you an example. Um, uh, when when Ravi Dasa was calling me, he say he say brain brain to weapon, brain to weapon, click weapon. <laughs> We've got they've got a big they say there's a big monstrous rat in Sheila's uh, um, Sheila's trash can. Can you go check it? I'll check. <laughs> Brain and weapon. That was our brain here. <laughs> weapon. <laughs> so, so um, actually, that was an interesting story. I'll tell that. Uh, and and uh, then with the other times I've told this, but I, it, you know, I, I got a bit jaded. Be, I wish I had saved all the notes that I got from different people. Oh, there's this huge monster. There's oh, there's this giant thing. And it always was. I'd walk in. It was some <laughs> mouse going. Please don't hurt me. <laughs> it was like it was like a big rat. He's there. There's all hyperbole all over the place. So I'm coming to the Jesus Grove where Sheila's cook, his Italian cook, was there, and he he was looking quite. Oh, you know, you've got to see this, and uh, there was this plastic trash uh, can, big thing, and okay, show me your, show me your your rat. <laughs> He's in there. He says. Okay, um, I'll, I'll I'll take a look. I lifted the lid, saw two huge sets of black eyes. It went. <laughs> it's a big rat in there, because you, know? you can see the glint of his eyes. And I went, I closed it. It's like, God, I don't know about this one. So I told the little Italian guy. I said, Now, now when I count to three, I found a brick. You know, so I said, now when you count to three, okay, three, three, yes, three, two, three, said, okay, so one, yes, 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 one, you're going to lift it, right, yes, I will, yes, so one, yes, yes, two, yes, yes, I hear two, two, three, yes, <laughs> he didn't lift it, said, lift <laughs> the lid, <laughs> he pulled it off. I w raised up and then I went, oh my God, this rat had, had, it was like a cartoon character. This rat had gorged himself on really good food. It was all piled. You know, it was only about this deep and he was down there. He was about that big. And he literally is like a, the, the only part that looked normally like a rat was the head and everything was literally a pear. <laughs> Like it's it almost like he, he was one of those characters where he was blown up like a balloon and the hands are like this and the feet are like that. I mean, he was kind of like that. He had gorged himself and gotten huge, so huge he couldn't even lift himself up. And he had that universal look that all mammals have. And it was literally like, oh, shit. Because <laughs> you're the prick. And then I... Fortunately, I dispatched him. We didn't know what hit him. So, and I just retrieved the brick and closed the lid. And that was the end. He became part of the compost. <laughs> you know? So, um, so trans, uh, trans morality is the thing that Krishna was trying to tell him. But the more, the more, the thing that really anchored me to this was not the warrior and all of that, not the John Wayne part of this. But I was immediately remembering that 
thing that happened to me when I was 21, because the climax to the debate that Krishna is having with Arjuna is that Krishna shows his divine form. And I mean, if you've seen some of the wonderful Hindu artwork uh, that, that, that shows it, it's like, it's like Arjuna is like trying to hide behind his, namaste hands and there were times when osho would do his big eye meditation over me that i was like going oh, please can i hide behind my hands because it's like ultimate nakedness and he's kind of cowering looking at this it's like and it's like infinite lines and lines of krishna's head changing into worlds changing into angelics changing into demons change, and it's like it's like all that happening good bad ugly and glorious and this is the divine form. And finally he says, please, please come back to your form. I, this is too much for me. It's, I feel like I'm going to be burned up. And he did. But finally, though, Krishna really lost the debate, says my master. Because uh, finally he, he resorted to the same old thing that all religious manipulators do. He said, it's God's will that you do this. You are supposed to kill all those people. It is God's will that you hold the crown. You know, and you can't argue against that. But Osho, being an enlightened great master, he used to take a lot of those stories and give his own enlightened take on it. And uh, I'm, I'm going to write a short story about this based on what he said. Uh, because... He said, uh, if, our, if, if I had been Arjuna, he said, he would have, I would have said, all right, then if it's God's will that these men are going to die, it's God's will that I don't want to do it. It's God's will that get off my chariot <laughs> and you sort this mess out yourself, Mr. Krishna. I'm going, it's God's will that I'm taking my brothers and we're all going as we always wanted to, to meditate in the Himalayas. That's God's will at this moment, and then leave the battlefield to these idiots, including the divine idiot Krishna. And and so, um, so anyway, uh, the how can I square the circle after all that? Um, so I continued to have experiences after I came back from India. Uh, when I was there for three months, 1980, my first trip there, I nearly died. I had three brushes with death. I nearly died. It's funny how I have to crest my sasa right now. Um, I I nearly died three times. At the end of my stay in India, I suddenly, the bronchitis that almost everybody had. Back then, India was wild. It was, it was developing nation time. And it was such a shock. Oh, the water was not good. They had to boil your own water. And we were doing groups, so you didn't do enough of it. It was very polluted. It's changed a lot over, over the time. But then it was real uh, spiritual boot camp uh, in those days. And so I was, um, my bronchitis, I was supposed to have a leaving darshan with Osho where you get energy from him because of my time to leave and go back to California. And... Um, so I was having a little party with my friends and, and in, in the space of one hour, I suddenly became seriously ill with walking pneumonia that became severe pleurisy in both my legs. So I collapsed and they literally had to carry me to a rickshaw, three wheel rickshaw and carry me to the number 70 Corgan Park, um, ashram medical center, which they sent me there because usually I wasn't a resident. So it was like big taboo that I wasn't a, you know, part of the permanent communards at the time, but that's where they sent me. And so I'm, I'm put into a, behind a veil uh, in the main room there, the screen is closed and I'm laying there in one of the waiting beds and I'm literally convulsing. <laughs> I'm watching myself there inside. I'm just watching myself going <laughs> like it was happening to somebody else. And I, I think my fever was approaching 104 or something like that. It was, <laughs> um, and at one point, uh, a, a lady from Switzerland that I still contact, uh, she she just came and 
this little young woman and she put her hands on me and it, she took the, the shivering away. And she was a real healer, you know, just, and then I, I looked, I said, thank you, thank you. And, and now outside of the curtain were two yelling, well, one screaming woman and a very calm voice, a very British voice responding. And, and so who, the, the man that, uh, so anyway, there's this English lady is like, he, well, he's, he's not, he's not a communist. He's, he's one of the guests. We should take him immediately to the Indian hospital. Of course, that would have been terrible because, you know, in India, if you, as I learned when I had my, one of my friends get very sick and I ended up helping her recover is it in india if you're alone every, you know, everybody has family so the family takes care of you and the nurse is, and this is at that time I, I don't know if it's changed but so you the nurses aren't there to take care of you they're there to give you drugs and things but the family is there to take care of you so i suddenly discovered with my lady friend who was really sick and i had i had to stay there day and night and help her um and be her family so i did it but so anyway, to send me a novice out into the Indian hospital land, I probably would have died, you know. But anyway, um, so so there, so she's saying, well, he's got to go, he's got to, he's not, why did, we got to keep the beds for our workers and all that. I said, well, well, you've got to understand that he's, he is really sick. He's really sick because he had seen me in this big, tall stork of a British man. And and with this beautiful mellifluous voice, he said, "So, and she's still, rah, rah, and the more he, she gets, even more." Rah, rah, well, he's like, "Yes, I know, but this is it." And and he later became a good friend of mine, and it's Osho's doctor, actually, Doctor Amrito, and uh, uh, and and now uh, just because of what's happened recently, he is he has now been given the job. I used to, we used to sometimes when he'd be finished with Osho taking care of him, we'd go off a few blocks down to the five star blue, blue diamond to its bar. And like, like authors, because he is an author, very good one, and usually do, is they, you know, take down a few gins and that cancerous uh, IPA beer in India, which had lots of glycerin in, in it. Like it was literally come out like gunks if you could pour it out. Um, uh, and, and so we, oh, this is, this is an idea. You take this idea. And they, okay. You take this idea. I'd say. <laughs> and, um, so, so yeah, so, uh, now he is actually, uh, because, uh, Jay Ash, who has been the person who has been running the place uh, since Osho left his body in, uh, January 19th, 1990. Now he is head of the Osho Resort and the OIF and the whole thing. He hasn't said anything yet. And I'm, I just sent him good energy because I used to say when we were a little buzzed and we're looking at each other and stuff, he says, you know, because when he got the job after Osho left his body, I said, you know, I am so glad that I wasn't chosen to get your job. <laughs> And and uh, I almost uh, at the right time I might send him a little email and say, well, I still feel that way. <laughs> you know, get him to laugh or something. But anyway, um, so, but he kind of saved my life. So, and uh, but that's whole, how things have changed with all that and the 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 organization and stuff is is a story I will say for another day, which is really a study in seeing how a living religiousness becomes a religion and how we all the the exoteric part of members of it and the esoteric members both have their part in this interesting drama of how this happens um and there's been a lot of arguments on youtube or facebook you know a lot of the sannyasins in their top chat rooms argue about this one quote that osho made in the ancient music of the pines which was a book on zen that he did back in what we call puna one I mean, that was before the ranch the, I, I was at the tail end of puna one and then when the ranch folded there was puna two and i was there for that as well but um he he basically um i had to point out to all these people having this huge religious argument with each other 
uh, is I said, wait a minute, guys, it sounds like the, you're all missing whether you're on the side of one side or the other. Don't you remember the first three words are really fundamental in understanding? He said, I am creating two groups. The master creating two groups. Now, so they're not like supposed to be, there's got to be, so it's funny how the, everybody was not listening to that. And I said, so all your arguments are not taking into account that there's a device here. The master said, I am creating these two groups. And, and so, you know, because they both have their function. You know, the people who preserve the words, preserve the temples, who make sure that 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 the teachings of the master can live for thousands of years have their role to play. And he said, fundamentally, what will happen is the people who are living the teaching, the esoterics, will at a certain point, because they're naturally rebellious, they're going to kind of one after another be kind of cast out. So that the the foundation, you know, uh, that can build upon that uh, can happen. So, um, so the so but that's another story. Uh, the story I want to stay with is how I somehow managed to get back because I I was laying there in the bed. I could start hearing the music a few blocks away wafting through the sitars and the drums waffling through the the banyan trees and what he would do is um it, the energy darshan he was doing this experiment with energy darshan where he had a little switch where he could with his foot turn off all the lights in the commune at once and everybody had to stop what they're doing and just kind of get into this kind of group energy that he was building and he would surround himself with uh his his female channels and they would just dance and just get into this pure feminine wildness, just dancing and and be so kind of grounding the energy. And then he'd have people who were leaving. He would lean forward and touch their third eye with his thumb or his forefinger and just imbibe them with this energy. So, And I so wanted to do this, but here I am laying with a, under a mosquito net on a wickery kind of bed, and I'm... I'm feeling actually my my right lung has ceased to function because now it feels like a cold alien object in my chest. It was colder than the rest of the body around it. And it was sort of, it, for some reason, it reminded me of a picture I saw before I came there of an x-ray from the Vietnam War with some North Vietnamese soldier had a dud um, a mortar shell come through this this area of his um, collarbone and kind of crush through his lung and just take the space where his lung used to be and you literally see it's like here's a lung over there and here's a mortar shell unexploded fins and everything where in his chest and I felt I've got the it's as cold as that picture I feel like it's a mortar shell it's not a part of me anymore kind of it'll be a helpful note when death is finally witnessed that I can uh, notice, uh, you know, that that the body I'm no longer being part of the body because it's definitely filling also my other lung. I was only breathing from this part of my lung, and so I'm laying there and say, you know, if I, if I may not survive the night, and I can really, I can really say from personal experience how pneumonia can really get you. It can really take you down all the way, even a 25 year old young strappling man and so i'm laying there and uh i'm hearing the music and i said well osho i have no idea how i'll ever get back forward to come back or ever see you again so all right i'm i in my without saying it i was just saying my energy i just relaxed and said give me my energy darshan right here because i gotta let go of this attachment to being around you because i'm going to be on the other side of the planet and if I can't find a way to have an immediate conscious connection with you, heart connection, then that's what I really need to do. So, but I'm verbalizing. It was all like instant under insights that the words. And so I laid there and I wafted off to sleep. Next morning, I was breathing in both lungs again. Everything had really improved. 
And I was strong enough to get up and I was take uh, that morning I left the hospital. And then in the next two or three days, I, uh, I made my way back to Bombay, Mumbai now, and uh, in a cab, got got on the plane, went overland uh, to Heathrow Airfield in Britain, and then went overland to New York City, and then had to stay in New York City, sleeping on the marble floor because the winter had closed the airport, big blizzard. But, you know, now, now I really kind of was a seasoned veteran of living in wild places. And so it was like, if I had done that when I was going, it would have been a big trouble. Here I am just in my orange robes and cotton. <laughs> I just get my pack and lay on it. And it was like, not up. I can do this. <laughs> I just almost died. And I just come across the world and I can do this. And so... I slept there and got on in the morning. There was a flight out. And then I, I have a picture. Sometimes I show it on my website, a picture of me when I finally got back to San Pedro, California. And I'm like this little stick neck. And, you know, I'm, all, I'm grinning. <laughs> and I'm like, ee. And, and um, I, uh, my doctor saw my tests and actually called me as you get your butt down here. He's, he's the guy who say, take two pills and I'll see you after golf. So I went, I went to him and, and he was uh, into Zen, thank God, as <laughs> outside of California being all woo, because what I told him, he said, look, you should be in a hospital. You have severe pleurisy in both your legs. I don't even know how you're standing. And then I smiled at him and I said, I am standing because of the grace of my master's healing. My master's energy has carried me all the way back to Los Angeles. And and he kind of went, well, okay, yeah. Because you can see it, my, I was skin and bones, but I was radiant. And and felt this feeling of grace in the, in the room. And said, well, if anything happens, just go to the hospital immediately. And so I began my slow recovery. Um, and then uh, a few months later, on Ash Wednesday, uh, 1981, uh, I was uh, getting, I was going to, uh, we had Utsava Meditation Center down in Laguna Beach and from San Pedro, it was about a two hour drive through the city and uh, I was getting ready to go. And then at some point I suddenly felt like there was a huge, big boot, so big that I couldn't even see it. Like I was the smallest little microbe and I couldn't see it, but I could feel it over my head and it was about to step on me and so i i had this i was feeling i think i'm going to die something's about to happen i was i had i was going to go down and see my girlfriend sanyas and who was going to make dinner for me at the at the center so so uh i i was hovering at the doorway felt like i, I don't know when i should move or go and then suddenly some invisible hands thrusted me off the threshold down to the car. I got in my two-door Maverick. Um, uh, and I, 45 minutes later in Long Beach, California, I'm going through my green light and some uh, Mexican illegal alien driving his, his brother's huge station wagon um, without a license. <laughs> uh tried to run, run the intersection and hit me hit my driver's door at 55 miles an hour my head in recoil i was seat belted my head in recoil hit the uh, window at 55 miles an hour that way <laughs> and knocked me out but what i experienced inside my thick head it's amazing how the blows this has taken without much damage. Um, the uh, I felt the the car the con the the reality of the car the wheels the dashboard the the glass it all in the sound of the explosion of the collision it all ripped away all reality as I knew it ripped away like ripping sheets just ripped away and I was thrown into an infant goldenness. And um, in that infinite goldenness, um, 
I was not thereing. I, in fact, Robert Monroe had really wonderful ways, especially in his far journeys, his three books. He came, he really taught me how to talk, use linear language to get a little closer to something that really can't be expressed in a normal way. Because what happens here is not what happens there. It's a different thing. And so I am in this infinite goldenness. And I am not therein in that infinite goldenness. And there's two others not therein too. And we are, we are not sitting there. And we never said anything. But th things were heard that were never told. So these two impressed without saying a thing impressed upon me, if I were to put it into words, um, that um, you're home now. Uh, this is, in fact, you've never left. This is your home. And, and then they impressed upon me and they said, and it was a complete like open-ended, no judgments for and against, like it's pure communication of suchness. Tagata, as Buddha would call it, that such is the case that you are in this infinite goldenness. Such is the case that you are, um, that we can talk to you without talking and you understand without thinking. Uh, and the message they gave me was, if you wish to stay here, since you've never left, you can stay here. You don't have to go back. But we are here to remind you that you chose to go back there. And that was something because I had dreams as a child of how much I did not want to be born again. And in fact, I was, I was holding on inside my poor mother for 15 hours until finally the doctor had to push, I got a little birthmark from that, push me out because I didn't want to go out. It was a big, I really didn't want to come back here again one more time or whatever. And, but so it was like, they were talking about it. They're like saying, uh, without talking or saying, they're impressing upon me that uh, we're here to tell you that you chose to go back. So I'm response able to go back. That is my responsibility. And so I then impressed upon them without saying anything. As I was kind of, the, the quality of the goldenness was like, like music, that if you wanted to see the world that I came from, it's in the bass, counter bass tubas and the counter bass strings. It's, they were kind of off in the bright brass and high sweet strings. Uh, so I that and that lower tessiture was Long Beach, California. <laughs> and so I said, I'm I impressed upon them. I'm really going to kick myself from going back from here to Long Beach, California. <laughs> and then I woke up in the car. And the first thing I felt was while well, I was laying way over, I was, I'm I'm still quite um double jointed too many lives as a yogi i guess even, even at this advanced age pushing 70 um but uh i was really really limber in those days and and what had happened is i my head had gone way over and as to the point where i'm literally seeing my, my osho mala with his face on it and the first impression i had in normal time was well at least that isn't broken and I kind of had a, a dual knowing that I, I knew I'm missing time because I had a slight pain in the side of my head where I hit the window at 55 miles an hour, uh, recoiling. Uh, and and so uh, the first thing I did is I, I, I sat up in the chair and I felt as if I'd been a time traveler, come back from a million year journey back to this reality. I felt this energy of coolness radiating all inside and out of me like an aura of coolness. Um, and I was in slowly, very, I was incredibly relaxed and refreshed. 
I was looking at the the uh, dashboard was an accordion, and the the drive shaft was bent. Um, my seat was kind of normal. The other seat was tilted. It hit most of the force had gotten not in the door, but in the in the dashboard. It took most of the force of those fifty five miles of this big boat of a of a station wagon that he uh, hit me with. And and then I I started giggling when I saw the the uh, brake pedal and the drive pedal. They had literally somehow managed to crunch together and tie themselves into a bow. <laughs> so I laughed. I giggled at that. Now, while all that's happening in the car for me as I'm coming back from some distant experience, I uh, over t later on, I got the reports of what was going on outside with all the people watching what was left of this crash and watching this very pale man with his head way too far over. So everybody assumed, including the paramedics who were working on the guy who hit me, who had bashed his arm pretty bad in, in his own act of uh, running the red light. And, and, um, so so uh, there was this man from Ohio who called them in, who is the person that told me all of this. And, and how people were all waiting. Said, oh, I think that that kid must have been the force of the must have broke his neck. His, his head's way forward. <laughs> he, can't, he must have broke his neck. It's because his neck is white as a sheet. And they and then and then, of course, there was this moment where they're all gasping because suddenly I lifted my head up. And sat straight, and people, as she said, we, were, we thought it was like Lazarus coming back from the dead, man. It was like, oh my God, he's alive. And and so that brings me back to me in the car, because the outside world is trying to get my attention in a tap, 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 tap on the window. So I look over and I see one paramedic who's nose to the glass trying to tell, talk to me. And the other paramedics got the jaws of life. Boom, boom. And he's ready to open this thing like a, like a crab, you know, this car and pull me out. And so he, the first one saying, can you get out? I wouldn't, I looked down at myself. Yeah, I'm all here. No blood, no anything. I'm all complete. And I went, um, yeah, <laughs> just very calm. And so my part of the door was still working. I guess the other part was broken off. So I open the door, I pull it open, I step out into an intersection filled with gasoline, an ocean of gasoline, and I'm standing there in my maroon swami clothes. And I was in maroon, my mala. I mean, so these poor people, they first seen this guy waking up and now he kind of walks out like a swami. You know, here's this in Indian looking white guy and they're, they're like, oh my God, what is this? And and the first thing my eyes set, settled on was this van splashing across the intersection of gas coming at me. And his suspenders were trying so hard to keep his huge belly in their control. <laughs> as, as he's running and his belly is like, no, stand, stand there. Don't go back like that. And he, as he gets closer to me, he's got kind of this bald on the top, bozo hair, kind of out. Um, he's missing his front teeth. And and he but he was just this, he grabs me and picks me up off my feet. This is how in shock these poor paramedics were in. They were literally like going, oh. and and he said, "Oh, son, it's so glad you're alive." Uh, and he said, "Damn, sure, good beads." So he started grabbing my beads and running his hand up my mala, my magic beads or something. Damn, sure, good beads. I said, "Well, yeah, they are." <laughs> So that's the moment he put me down. I kind of had to take command of the situation. Kind of ironic when you're the victim and you have to come. Um, everybody, <laughs> attention, please. <laughs> I'm missing some memory. <laughs> and and, uh, and then suddenly they snapped out of their 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 shock. And suddenly, it was, oh, yes, okay, you come here. We'll put you in the ambulance. Because I said, I need to go to the hospital and have somebody look at my thing. I have a concussion. I'm missing some time. I need to lay down and check me out. It's, Oh, yes, yes. Mm, okay. And then suddenly you know, they're all being uh, together with it. Now, um, 
at the hospital and then later when the filing of the reports happened later uh following week there was this old police cop you know and he'd and in both cases he said the same thing he said you know what i've been 30 years in the police force i've scraped a lot of people off the streets i've seen a whole lot of accidents you know it's la car car capital you live and die by the car in la and he was like going what happened to you is a, i've never seen anything like that it was like a miracle i you you look dead and then there you were, and you're not even harmed except for a little bump on the head. And that I just uh, say that that's just miraculous. And so he had to say it twice. You know, he's probably since passed on to that into the same mystery that I went in, and and it's a time to want to look golden at that point, and came out. Well, I really was changed by that. What had happened in the Satori. Um, was deepened to where really um it's almost like it's prepared me for a lot of what i do now uh all these things have happened um and and then the third brush of death happened three days after that i was in uh my mom had gone off my father and i were there and i was feeling uh, you know the effects of concussion i was pretty vulnerable and i was trying to say to him you know dad i'm gonna need some help i i mean you can't live in la without a car in those days it's just not possible it's like the desert without a camel good luck with that <laughs> you know so so um and then the all the problems because my father was in deep into his alcoholism and you know all the things that were going on uh were coming to a head and and he just kind of was giving me no way out i couldn't be this it couldn't be that he, you know he's taurus so when i came back all dressed in red he was like a bull seeing the red and and he he was kind of seeing if something happened he says you think you're really something don't you I said, well no, i don't know why i am <laughs> some things have happened i'm not the person that left and came back and and so there was this point where he was just kind of giving me no way out but just to kind of emasculate me and and all that so i had just finished drinking a glass of water and suddenly i felt because it came up a lot in the therapy groups that i did in in, uh, in Pune. i mean we had these um there's a movie called ashram it's probably somewhere online somewhere and uh it's it shows it was actually permitted by ocean everybody to, back in the Pune one period to show our encounter groups which were really something I mean, everybody naked in padded rooms with all these, some of the best uh, human potential movement people in the world all ended up disciples of Osho, you know? So it was it was truly catharsis at its peak. And uh, you felt like you burned through a thousand lives every day in those rooms. And and I highly recommend the whole world go through that. <laughs> if they had a super group, if everybody could be in a super group for three weeks, it would end war. It would uh, end a lot of the things that, all this savagery and stuff has to have an expression. Um, and if you can do it in a protected way with people who are going to watch you and make sure you don't go too far or anything like that or hurt anybody or yourself, um, then in that situation, you really can let go. First, you let go all your clothes because just like the people in the Naked and Afraid shows, you know, at, at first, it's a shock to be around everybody naked, men and women and everybody. And then you get, get over that. And then there's this weird, innocent thing that happens. You start to, well, this is humans in their skins. These are humans not wearing their ego costumes anymore. This is where we're just this these naked people, like the animals who don't wear pants and ties, you know, it's like, now we're like, it's almost like this beautiful, innocent thing takes over where, you know, you're, yeah, we're all a bunch of hamsters in the cage, you know, just being hamsters, human hamsters. <laughs> and and, and uh, so it was, uh, it was a May, I'll be writing a lot about the things that happen in these groups because it was uh, really unique in, in, in the annals of, of, of human potential movement but also of just you know how the kind of crucible that people go through in spiritual paths like this 
I, never been anything quite like what we did. And um, so, so anyway, I, I, one of the things I learned, uh, I had this breakthrough where everybody's calling me a phony from Southern California because I was like, I like you. I really like you. And I had this squinted too much sunshine uh, face where I was always like, hi. <laughs> It's just, and and then um, I had this run run around with a with a red headed green eyed lady from Holland, who uh, who we ended up triggering each other. And and what long story short, I'll tell more of the story at another opportunity. But what what happened was I discovered that my survival mechanism to survive my father, who I dearly loved, and he loved me, but he was a used to be an army air corps champion boxer I mean, he grew up in watts uh, the only gringo when it was a barrio then so even as a kid he had to fight his way to school and fight his way home so he had a rough life and he and you know he coped with it by drinking and smoking and drinking <laughs> remarkable amounts of alcohol that i could not imagine uh of course he died at 71 kind of burned him out but um he um he I, to, you never. I've discovered that I, I I suppressed my anger because if he were drunk and he wouldn't want to do it, but I just realized that it saved my life because. But it also all these programs that we get into these these copium programs that you know they they're not to be condemned. They when a kid is learning how the land of the adult giants are not what they seem, and the child has to find ways to uh survive it and, and it's all kind of under the surface not quite conscious but it comes out in these groups and you suddenly realize i um and and as i was crying we both kind of were shrieking at each other shrieking shrieking, shrieking and there's one moment where we both blinked at the same time the shrieking stopped and we both fell in each other's arms uh the the dutch lady and me and as they were sobbing and then one of the group leaders this beautiful black gal from south africa amazing lady she started stroking the back of my back and said, look, you know, you, you're phony. You've been phony because like 70% of your energy has been suppressed in anger that you've kept a lid on. And now it all came out. And actually afterwards they were saying, you know, we were getting a little worried. The group leaders were saying, you were going to kill all of us. <laughs> you know, so because it all came out at once and it was volcanic. And I could have. But I didn't. There's something about these groups with an enlightened master, an aura, that it's amazing how things don't go to the end like that. I remember one time, Manan Sheila, who was prominent in the wild, wild country, he was, she was Osho's secretary. I knew her, and sometimes she'd tell stories to me about daily things that happened. And one time we were having this spate when we were building our ranch and our city there, that there were all kinds of things happening where somebody fell off a roof, but they landed and didn't hurt themselves. Or a guy was doing the backhoe next to a 12,000 volt line and his backhoe hit it. And the whole thing fried the backhoe, but he wasn't fried. And, and so Sheila's like dealing with all this. And so as Osho was writing something, she was saying, Bhagavan, how is it that... That people don't just get killed or things that we're all doing. It's dangerous. And he's writing. He just looked up and he went, and smiled, went back to writing. <laughs> and it was his, his, the, the aura of the master. It's the aura of a great master is able to. I don't, I don't think he even knows how it's done. I mean, I think there's the, the real story here is that a lot of things that are incredibly spiritual are not will driven because it's beyond will. It's just like, and, and it's like you, you, the millipede can walk on a pair of 500 legs perfectly as long as the millipede doesn't think about it. And there's that Aesop fable story when the bunny asks him, how are you able to do that? Well, I never thought, let's think of that. He falls over and is you darn bad bunny. Look what you did to me. I can't talk, walk anymore. And, um, there is a quality, a, a higher spiritual reality that non-doing attracts happening. And it has to be a point where you're indifferent 
or better, you're in a state of indifference. Because when people think of indifference, it's always, well, I don't really care. Well, yeah, it can go either this way or that. That's passive aggressiveness. But indifference is neutral. So it's like open and available, but without any design, just being kind of in a sense of ignore sense where you're not like identifying with things, but they're before you and you're hearing them, you're in the world. I mean, um, you know, I'm, I'm seeing my bookshelf in the back there, but I'm not like going, what's that? Why, why is that bookshelf there? You know, I'm not identifying with it. So there's this quality. It's not like you're ignoring it and pretending things are not there. It's this where you're just neither this nor that with it. And then a lot, it brings you into the center of the moment. And then a lot of magical things happen effortlessly and you're not even anticipating them. You just are, are then learning a spiritual response ability where, and it's, it's something you ha don't have to achieve. You are this very nature of your eternal present self is this. And then you, you come back to it. You had it when you were born. The, it's innocence, in a sense. And it's, um, it's interesting because Osho, Swami Dhyan Arjuna, or Dhyan Arjuna, my, my name means Dhyan Meditation Arjuna, innocence. So it's my path, is it's my potential in the name. Whether I fulfill it or not is really up to up to me, not not up to the master. The master doesn't do anything. All the happening happens to you because of the context of a master is a human being that's living in that complete luminous uh, potential that all all people have. You know, if you were a wave in the ocean seeking a wave master, the wave master makes you aware that the surface of you, which you thought is who you are, has nothing to do with who you really are, which is the ocean inside the shape of the wave. That it can continue to gain new containments for it, new lives, millions and millions of lives as shapes of waves, but it's always the ever-present, ever-eternal oceanic beingness you know god is a the personification of god is a, an imaginary friend for adults who cannot feel the godliness within you can't find it i would contend don't believe me don't disbelieve me test what everything i'm saying through your own experience I know you'll come to the same conclusion, but it doesn't matter what I say right now. It is, it has to be experienced. So there I was talking to my father, trying to, and then what happened was all that pent up 25 years of suppressing my anger, I could feel it in my horror building. I couldn't stop it. It was like I, I wanted to, but here I got the glass in my hand. And then it suddenly, I suddenly let out a shriek that was so loud that some of the neighbors almost called the cops in our trailer park, but they didn't. Again, grace of the master didn't get anybody to interrupt a, a very important moment for my father and I. I took that glass and with all the hate and anger, I said, God, I threw it in, into the some of the cupboards of the kitchen and shattered into a million pieces. And I said, I hate you. I wish you were dead. And he leaped out of the chair. I leaped towards him. He leaped towards me. And in the moment we touched, because it was like a fight, I, I went back into that space again. I wasn't, I was in that complete let go. And he, I was watching him very impassionately from a distance inside of myself, watching him trying to, he was mad. He was, he didn't hit me, but he was like trying to, he was kind of unhinged by what I'd said and he couldn't even fight. And he was just like rolling me back and forth in the glass on the shag carpet. And then I said, dad, dad, <laughs> just this is quiet. I said, um, 
if if you really want to kill me just hit me here where the i hit the car if you really want to kill me just punch me right there and um he let me go and then this rather comical period happened after that where we're my, my god what if mom comes home we're both in trouble <laughs> You know, it's like, so we're, so we're kind of throwing invectives at each other, but we're both, but the, our bodies are actually being responsible. We're cleaning up the mess. We're picking up all the glass. We're sweeping everything, cleaning the water and all that. And then there's this one point where he says, and, and, and if you were really a man, you wouldn't be wearing that red stuff. And you'd have one of these, he points between my legs. And I said, oh, and I said to him, I said, you know what, when I was um, in those groups in India and I was visualizing myself as naked, you know what, I didn't have a dick. And you know why? You took it from me. <laughs> you know, when hit, when truth hits us, the, you know, the mind and the ego can try to stop it. When it really hits the spot, it's like, oh, it hit him like a blow. And it was like, well, oh, no, no, that's not true. <laughs> when you know he's on, it's in there. It's it's in there. So, no, the, the snake didn't bite me. Uh, and then what happened after that was he got in the lounge chair and I sat before him and we talked and had a little more encountering. And then I kind of just, I kind of lost it. I, my, you know, my brain was a little addled from being hit. And I kind of did one of those, Whoa, and just kind of, fell into my own lap and that and he immediately became sober and he said no son it's all right it's all right and then i i i sat up again and then uh, with a different voice now i said you know we've it's not about me making you wrong or you making me wrong that's what we were doing for god knows how long it's not about that. That's just wasting time. It's what what's happened is that we've 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 walked through this life together, and and we we don't know who we are. And he sat back in that chair. He took that in, and he said, "Yeah, I don't know who I am." And I've got to find out. So he left that evening, went into a hotel room and just with himself, just get out of the whole scene. I think on the third night, he looked into the big window in the bath thing and he said, I got to go to AA and I got to stop drinking. I got to change my life. And that was his beginning of a very beautiful transformation that, um, Fortunately for him and me, uh, we we ended up being really good friends. And it was a blessing with, because there was a time in my life as a child, I really thought of picking up a bat and hovering over his side of the bed when he was asleep and break his head open. And I'm, so I, I have compassion for kids that ha do it, unfortunately, and have it. I mean, it's... Just, I was lucky I didn't do it, but it came and it's amazing. That's why you can never give up on people because you can go in such deep, dark places of hatred only because deep down hate is also deep love. And so, but we had to go through these catharsis. We had to blame each other. We had, I had to see that my survival mechanism Though it saved me from being killed by him in a drunken stupor, it it was a high price that I, I wasn't okay with being angry. I was Mr. Nice Guy. I was the child of the alcoholic, classic child of the alcoholic, trying to make everybody happy in the family. Um, and, and so it was, it changed. And then uh, the last time I saw him was in early 1997. Mm -hmm in uh, Sepulveda Beach or in California when I was down there and I was still up here now in Pacific Northwest. And and I remember I, I, cr I crawled up into, he was in the passenger seat. My brother had this big van and the family and everything. I crawled up on his lap and I, I hugged him and put my head against his ear and I said, I love you, Dan. 
And he said, I love you, son. And then to my surprise, as much as to his, I said, goodbye. I had this, there was a premonition that this was it. And it was, and he stopped. He kind of, he could feel it. It's a little vulnerable huh? in his heart and he let it go. He said, goodbye, son. And I went back to Pacific Northwest and um, he was having trouble with his enlarged heart from too much alcohol. And, and he was, um, uh, he had these, uh, moments well he his last girlfriend was a secretary in riverside california of a mortuary and so my father had a great sense of humor and said well son i i think i planned that good when, <laughs> when i go i'll be taken care of <laughs> so anyway he's with her and he's got his walker and he feels this profound blackness that he said was like solid. It was like real. And he could feel it coming from his toes, climbing up his legs. And the moment it touched his heart, he was completely blacked out. And then when he woke up, his girlfriend was over him. Bud, Bud, we called him Bud Hogan. Bud, wake up. And, and there he was back. And then his first impression was he couldn't imagine how he got himself so tangled up in his walker. I mean, it was like, he said, I don't know how I got myself so tangled up like that when I obviously fell down. And, and so, um, uh, you know, he was, so he was having these moments um, and um, she had, a, she had a, um, a, a nephew who was a baby and had been in an auto accident. And this kid was an old soul, amazing kid. I met him and uh, he he um he, he so my dad used to drive him around and take out the folding uh wheelchair for him and all because he was all like bent up but he had this beautiful soul in him and it's because of him that i know how my father died because my dad being my dad it was a big strong guy even or even when he wasn't he was told now don't lift too many chair wheelchairs and stuff like that so he has camaro um truck and he's uh he got the folded it in the back and he closed the gate turned around and obviously what he heard uh this boy heard he went oh shit <laughs> my famous last words of my father very butthug oh shit <laughs> and what was happening was he was starting to faint again so he's having one of those black spells and when it hit his heart he fell down but he wasn't killed by he probably would have recovered he fell back on the toe ball on the back of his head, which he had injured before. Oddly, they would do that again. And I think that's what took him out. <laughs> so, but it was amazing. It, 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 that's why even, even now with the, and I tell you, things now are developing in the world in these wars that are really bad. Uh, a new, new dangerous territory. Uh, that uh, really are putting, uh, you know, the um, the shock of Adyevka falling uh, in Russia, the Russians taking this fortress city. After 10 years of siege, it was taken in two days. It just fell apart. When that happened, the collective dumb heads of Europe and America started to panic. They realized, oh my God, we're going to lose this war. No, 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 we can't think that way. So now I've been hearing them talk crazy talk about actually finding a way to get NATO to bring all of its forces in to block Odessa and line them up against the Belarusian uh, northern border. And Russia saying, if you just step one foot into this war, we're at war with you. And you're, we're already at war with you. I mean, we've you, you know, you, you're you now these German German generals were caught red handed talking about, you know, this plan to blow up the Crimean bridge with with storm shadows or uh, Taurus, uh, the same version of a, of a cruise missile, like sending 40 of them at and taking the bridge down, which won't change the result of this war because the Russians have built a new train track on the land bridge, too. So they they don't. 
uh, it, it's not going to change the fate of this war. Ukraine is losing it. And but the problem is now we're really in a dangerous place because the United States is so lost in its hegemonic perception of itself. These leaders, this this two party system, which is one uni party of the deep state, cannot conceive of losing. And that's very dangerous because if you cannot concede of concede of losing, then uh, you may escalate yourself into taking the world with you and call it something else. So in the, in my personal life of deep, dark things that happen coming back into the light, there is a possibility somehow that the European leaders and the um, and the United States leadership, they're going to have to face and grow up and accept defeat because they've lost. Now, I mean, it's it's time for this young country to grow up and not be a child who, oh, I never lose, how do you do that? I'm gonna throw a nuke on you, you know? <laughs> a baby country with nukes, what a concept. Now, Russia is an older country. It has lost before, and it and it it accepted its defeat in the Cold War One, um, and uh, and it, then it was exploited very badly by America and others who wanted to finally do what Charles the couldn't do, Napoleon couldn't do, and Hitler couldn't do. Now we'll go in and seize Russia, break it up, privatize it take all of its great resources that we've been envious to have since the 1700s as a European stock with one track mindset, whether they're Europeans in Washington or Europeans in the other capitals. And, um, and they, they're, it's childish. It's, it's childish because they, they're seeing, well, we're just coming in as peacekeepers. So the Russians won't hit us. Well, my friends in France, Macron, and all you people. Uh, why, what does the word peacekeeper mean, you children? Peacekeeper means that you've already made peace with the people you're not even talking to who are in full-scale war with the proxy that you've backed up, even with your own officers and underground bunkers helping them blow up Russians, blow up, bomb Russian cities. And, and they've been incredibly restrained because they're adults. They know where this can go. Thermal nuclear devastation. And we're all alive, thank God, for the Russians having level heads because we would have blown this up in the second Cold War that started in 2014 when the West and America and allowed, and Victoria Newland was the main architect of it, and she's still around in the State Department, uh, had... Uh, created a coup to overthrow the democratically elected government in Ukraine and replace it with a provisional Nazi regime, which changed all the rules and all the third or 40% of the country, which was Russian speaking said, we didn't vote for this. This isn't democracy. This government, it hates us. It wants us to be ex expelled or destroyed and take all the land. And so they had to stand and fight. And that's what they've been doing since 2014. This war that started in 2022, February, has was already eight years of civil war going on there. And I've been reporting it. Hope Prophecy has been reporting it. Finally, I'm not so alone. There's a lot more people that are now coming around to this. And, and so... so Christian Murdy used to say, you are the world. And if you go deep into that, and to witness the entirety of that, if you are the world, then you're all the potentials of its good and evil. You are Hitler and you are Christ. You're Emmanuel or you're Genghis Khan. So, 
and everything in between you are the world all its wars and its peace and its uh you know its pieces that are actually preparations for war are exactly the things you can witness happening when you're having a not having a drama but building up in a peaceful veneer for another drama um it and if you can then begin to witness you are microcosm of the whole world as a watcher is what meditation is supposed to mean but it's uh, the word is is the worst word to use for it in english contemplation is not what meditation i'm talking about is it's about being here now witnessing this body mind and the world and in the witnessing of it understanding happens on its own accord things begin to drop on their own accord because you cannot transcend the mind you can only understand it so witnessing it and in the witnessing you are not giving it energy. You're not making an effort. It just happens that if you're watching your mind, it just so happens that the mind is not being fed. You're not trying to change what's happening. You're just watching it play as it plays and uh, where it goes. And, and if you try to fight with it, you just strengthen it. If you try to, uh, if you're in, in a panic and you try to stop panicking, stop panicking, you just get more panicky. All you can do is just let that go and watch it. And then what happens is the next moment goes by and suddenly you're not panicking anymore. Where did it go? Where did this thing that was going to drive me off a cliff it, it, a few moments ago, it's not there now. What? Because the mind exists with our identity to it. So you start to learn more and more about that. So a lot of these things that I've gone through have really helped me see this. And it's given me understanding and compassion for everybody because that's what happens when you're an anger type. I'm, you know, every ego has a, 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 a Gurdjieff used to say this in his enneagrams, every ego has its certain persona, main force. We have all these things in us, uh, anger, greed, fear but there's in my case my dominant ego trip was uh, anger which can become compassion now the other person is a victim they can become a king you know uh if a victim uh you know a uh, so there's all kinds of different ego types about i think eight of them in the in the enneagram that gurdjieff created it's mostly been used and often kind of turned into new agey stuff by a lot of different movements. But the source of it is Gurdjieff in his teaching, another great master from the 20th century. Um, and so, so these three things happen. And I wrote to Osho back in India about the stories I've just told you. And uh, I got a letter back from him this beautiful signature unique signature as he used to do and he basically said these um what has happened to you in these in this process is um most of your connection with the past has been broken and now um because yeah, i was asking if i could start a, a center and he said and here's the name of your center vikas it means growth. And so my center was in my little new car. It was a red little mini station wagon. And I'd haul in my tapes and sound systems. And I'd go to all the very numerous new age churches in Orange County and Los Angeles. And I was a mobile center. I would do meditation groups in the different centers. <laughs> and that's how Vikas began growth i knew so, someone that had i knew someone that had a name because no oh, yeah it's a common name yeah. in hindi name because i knew a lot of vikases too it's like prem <laughs> common name love and though dian my prefix dian it's funny as i when i was a kid and i fantasized someday that i'd become a parent I wanted to have a daughter and I wanted her name to be Dion, not Diane, but Dion. I said, how odd that I want it that way, not Diane, but Dion. And 
I never, I never did follow that path. I've many lives have been a father, a mother, and all of that. But in this life, it was a life to give birth to myself. And so the Dion is me. <laughs> the daughter is me. <laughs> Dion in uh, is Sanskrit, Dhyana. And now when Buddha taught it, he was speaking in Pali. So it became Jhana. And when Buddha's teaching moved with Bodhidharma to China, it became Chuan. And then when it moved to Japan, it became Zen. Zen is the, is transcends the Buddhist teaching. Actually, it is the flowering beyond Buddhist. And people call it Zen Buddhism. That's incorrect in my view. Um, Zen is Zen. It's the, it's the beginning of the path of dhyana out of India to China, to Japan, from Japan, all over the world. Zen is meditation. And it is, um, it is a pure witnessing. There's a beautiful statement. Walking in Zen, sitting in Zen, whether active or inactive, one is always at peace. Even, even at the moment when the samurai's sword is unsheathed and coming at you, the man of Zen smiles. So. Well, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> I did not expect to talk, to tell this story again. And and like I've learned from Osho, Osho would tell a lot of stories, the same stories, but he always tell it. It was always new when he would tell it. And it, it, it was new this time. And I'm glad I could have shared that. Not, I'm not planning anything. I never plan what I'm going to say next. It is just, but there is a beautiful order if one can just kind of trust. Get, people make the mistake of thinking that faith is synonymous with trust. But trust is something you're born with. It is your essential nature. And faith is borrowed because when you're a child, you don't come in saying, well, what's the faith here? You learn, if you watch yourself, you look at the beginning of when you start thinking about faith, when meditation, you look back and the layers, you're just watching, waiting, and the layers of memory go back, back, back to the point where somebody told you about faith and that you should have it and and what they're way really trying to mean is something they've lost like all children lose when they grow up and because faith is kind of like a a shadow of the, the projected on the wall of the light of trust trust is I'll give you an example a lot of times great classical movies like Lord of the Rings is a great example. Frodo and Sam, uh, fundamentally the core of the nine that have to go. They, I mean, Frodo, he didn't choose it, didn't want it, but it was clear that the ring was his to take back to the crack of doom. And rather than get all caught up in his ego and all, he just said, well, what do I do? He'd already, his innocence, his trust, he just knew that that was his destiny and and then Sam came along with him. And all of them, the nine, were the nine in counterbalance to the nine ring wraiths of the dark. And But if you really watch the movie a lot, it's really a, a, about heroic innocence. And how these little hobbits, with the help of other people with other skills, um, were different races, dwarf, Legolas, the elf, you know, uh, our Aragorn and um, and also the one who died, you know, Boromir, um, who really had a struggle with it. Um, they they eventually all helped each other, even when they had to let go Frodo and Sam. They, they had to go this way. And you know, that beautiful moment, you know, where are they're on the riverbank and Fellowship of the Rings, one of the most beautiful parts of the music of that is where they're here they hear the fellowship theme 
in a higher octave. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 and what he then you know then there's this moment where strider's not so much strider anymore a little bit of the gondor king comes out of him and he says um no our we have to find pippin and mary you know we have to go because the the, the orcs have carried them off and um and you know, so it's not over yet only and then there's this beautiful part where they kind of grab each other's shoulders and you hear that incredible descent of it, it goes like it settled it anchored they were they got their center again and they go off to try to find mary and Bibbon. It's just a beautiful moment, a very Wagnerian moment, where in the Gesamtkunstwerk concept, you have the art form of music, the art form of drama, and their sets and designs, and how how the two become organic. You know, it, that scene without that beautiful descending of that theme, like a dream of what they dream this fellowship to be, and how it settles in this deep, dark, warm, brass settling, is like, that's the moment when, you know, they all, like, you know, look at him, says, he's our leader, really is, we're going, and then they run off, and then you see Frodo and Sam going off into the, into that, you know, whatever that horrible place they were going into, and it says, I, I, I don't think, I, and Sam, Frodo says, I don't think we'll ever see them again. And then Sam says, we will, Mr. Frodo. We will. Now the reality of innocence being the center, the being, uh, the trust being the center, it makes you prescient. You know, what was interesting about that whole series is just that it was kind of like, I see the Lord of the Rings is almost like an end of a of a Hollywood era of how to make movies. Yeah, you know, like back in you know during the kind of a uh, um, Ben Hur kind of era, mm. right? You know, there was it's Amazing colossal, film. yeah, it's a colossal, epic, lots of yeah, epic, right? And it's just and you know and then there was a period of time in in Hollywood that where it was just churning out junk, but there was this this period with Jackson that yeah. decided you know he's going to make this epic uh, film that no one thought he could make, yeah. and you know it was cutting edge with the cinematography and the CG and the costuming and all I mean just everything about it. The craftsmanship of it i just don't think there it, it was almost like the end of an era in hollywood that that no. whole series was the end of an era of how movies would be made and 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 the craftsmanship and the long arc of 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 filming that kind of series i write about this a lot i wrote it's one of my best articles in of in the Hope Prophecy Report was I've I've I mean for me it wasn't the end of it it was a resurgence of something that happens in the art forms. There's 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 always a period in the great art forms whether it's music dance drama um, where there's a the stars align. There's a window of possibility that opens. And, and suddenly, and the time has got darkness ahead of it. So in the case of, you know, people looking at the oncoming 21st century, it is certainly living up to all the forebodings that people have been having for these 24 years. And therefore, there was a time then opening for people to go back to the, to the real core of storytelling, which is the deepest myth the great heroic stories, the mythology. Myth is a wonderful word. I The subplot of my, which was the first full-bodied uh, biography on Nostradamus, Nostradamus, A Life and Myth. I strongly recommend all of you listening that you read it. I was surprised how, what, what reviews it got. It was a, 
it was a i always wondered why why haven't people written about nostradamus in a full like you know 400 page 225,000 word book you know the standard biography and because there certainly was more material from about him because he fortunately a lot of his almost everything he did survived because he was one of the early best selling authors of the printing press revolution so a lot of copies of everything, even his pamphlets, are still existing, and they're finding them more and more. So uh, if you were going to do anybody else, like Ruggieri, uh, one of his contemporaries as a magician, there's hardly anything, you know. And um, so the... So I've, I got halfway through the book, and I discovered why nobody had done it before. And I had to start it all over again. I had to realize that you cannot, people stopped trying to write about Nostradamus because they couldn't find the factual Nostradamus completely free of his myth. So I realized that rather than, rather than give up, embrace both. Because you cannot, the fact is you cannot extricate Nostradamus from his myth. Uh, his life uh, was uh, a strange crossroads with the word myth, which is one of those words that has, it, it, at its very basis meaning, is flim-flam, false, spurious. But at its highest point, it is a truth that transcends facts, a perennial truth that transcends factuality. Myth is one of the richest words in any language. And all the great myths uh, inspire us, even now, if those who read them. And, and then Peter Jackson took this incredible, I mean, Tolkien's goal was to create, to restore for England their mythology that kind of got lost. It's, it's the same mythology that Wagner drew from, because basically the Angles, the English, are, are cousin brothers and sisters of the Teutons and the Scandinavians and all of that. And so, and so it's interesting how they both drew from the same ring sources, the Vaslunga saga, the Nibelungen lied, uh, Schnorri's uh, Norris, uh, translations of the Norris Eddas, I mean, Gandalf is a character, and I mean, a lot of his names are outright taken from Vasilunga Saga, Gandalf, and all this. And so, um, so the thing that I hearken back to, because actually, I'll give you an example. I mean, there was a time, we'll call it the rock star art, where the population, the majority of people are into a certain art form. Every major art form goes through a cycle where it's the rock star and, and the people, the masses, for a moment, are into it. Now, in the 19th century, it was the late German romantic music that which dominated because of Wagner's revolution in tonality and atonality and his unhinging keys so that you could change if the key had to change to let your harmonics wander you didn't stay in b flat you went to c sharp you know you you he literally was starting to change the keys in tristan so so that the and the chord the tristan chord from his opera uh absolutely revolutionized it's been called the source of modern music the beatles all at it Everything, it comes from that. It was a major, they called it New Wave. And so it, it grew and grew. And by the, seven, the 1870s and 80s and 90s, it was the dominant, everyone went to the opera house to see. And there was all these new things being created, not just in Germany, but in France, in Italy, uh, in Russia. And then, I mean, opera and music drama, Wagnerian music drama was at its peak. And... It was where the go-to theater thing, and then it passed on. In fact, what happens is an interesting thing there. It seems to always have it happened with the Beatles, 
It happened with what Wagner did, very similar. Wagner and the Beatles shared the same um, courage to evolve the, the genre as far as it can go. In fact, very insightful, rare for his insights uh, as far as reviewers and critics are, but Hans Hanslich was a uh, fought with Wagner all the time in his writings in, in Vienna, but he also know, could take in that what Wagner was doing was not only genius, but he openly said, if Wagner keeps going like this, he's going to end the operas. There won't be any more operas. He will have played it all out because he's evolving it so fast. Now, the Beatles are a very rare band in modern music because unlike everybody else, they evolved constantly their sound. You just you start with uh, Love Me, Yeah, 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 and then you get into da -de -la -da -de -da 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 -de -da -da Let me take you down, because I'm going to Strawberry Hill. And then paperback rider and then you're going blackbird living in the dead of night la, da, dee, da, dee, da, da, da. and it just kept evolving and evolving to doom 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 one two three four five six seven all good children come to heaven you know um, rubber all so and what the happened was after a decade and they could do this because they spent two years in hamburg literally getting their ears and their fingers hmm. and their bodies playing everything in rock and roll from the 50s to the early 60s they literally had a knowledge of everything and they knew what was missing and that's from that foundation, they, they went through this incredible 10-year evolution, which effectively had as its future a point where they'd all have to break up. You know, all these other bands have tried to survive, and they've all done a thing where they stood still. Even some of my favorite bands, like the Beach Boys, who were literally, that's my folk music from my, I was in Redondo Beach, they were in Hermosa Beach, when I was growing up, this is my my peasant folk music, <laughs> beach boy music, and and I love it. And but they but they kept hosing down Brian because Brian Wilson was a genius, and his pet sounds are remarkable. And you know, one of the greatest songs ever written was the four very deep, moody, different changes of good vibrations. And when the Beatles heard good vibrations. They were shocked. They said, my God, we're not growing enough. He, look what Brian's doing. The reason why the Beatles did Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Heart Club Band and redefined the genre was because of Brian's I, I love the da, 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 da. softly sound. I know she must be kind. Doom, 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 doom. Well, I look into eyes and then change mood I'm picking up good vibrations completely different I'm picking up expectations it's like down there and then it flies good 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 vibration good 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 vibration and then it goes into a very kind of erotic innovation. Ooh, 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 ooh. Oh, let go of these. Oh, I don't know why, but she sends me there. Oh, another. Oh, good. Oh, and then a completely different mode, almost like prayerful. With the, with the organ gonna keep those alone good vibrations happening gonna keep those alone good vibrations happening 
and then set you up ding, 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 dum, ding, dum, ding. Ah! good vibration excitations goes down and good vibration La 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 and that led on to Walrus and that led on what Magical Mystery Tour and the White Album and Abbey Road. I didn't know the history of that. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's I mean, interesting. I mean, the Beatles, really, I mean, Paul and John were going, my God, we're behind the times. Brian has just <laughs> launched us into another dimension. And they, and if, without brian there wouldn't have been this happening so so that was also happening in these periods where an art form like popular music reached this peak in the 60s 70s 80s and and actually in the 80s was its beautiful peak because it it was literally a time that was very similar to what happened in the wagnerian period with music where vive la difference be yourself express this form in unique ways and not all sound like some corporate guy wants you all to sound like na 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 which is kind of where all the music is now it's like everybody's kind of going na 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 in one form or another and everybody sounds the same i mean um um there's it's interesting you bring up this 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 new way that you said that they called it new wave during the Vanguard. Yeah, Nova Volca. Right. Well, Nova Volca. Yeah. That, in, in, in the eighties, the early eighties, that was new wave. Yeah, it well, was called new wave. It's so, echo. It, it, these yeah. things echo. They come back. It's in the same in painting. Impressionist painting. There was a period where Van Gogh and all this and Gauguin started, and it was like a French phenomenon, and it ended up being this huge art form for about a generation, and then it moved on into other forms that were great, but they lost the mainstream audience. The, they weren't rock stars anymore. They were in some more cult corner of music. You know, when Cubism and Modernism happened, it, it didn't, but Impressionism broke the, the, the realistic form and got people more into the feeling the pictures rather than just seeing them as they are, just like the music was doing so so uh, to the lord of the rings i do not see it as an ending i see it as a return in a new form that is now this form of uh i mean actually a lot of epics were born out of i mean uh, lord of the rings uh and the most significant one is avatar and dune uh i haven't seen the new dune I'm going to see it tomorrow. I'm going to. I I haven't seen the first, but I know. I I know that book by heart. So, and all the from Emperor of Dune, Children of Doom, Doom Sire. Uh, so when I 1980s, I was deep into into that movie and into that novel. So so I'm going with a friend. So they said, "Well, you haven't seen the first one. Don't, don't worry. I know where it goes from there." <laughs> I, and I saw enough of what they're doing with it that actually, I i mean, uh, Villeneuve is, in, like Peter Jackson, is a, and Ridley Scott with Kingdom of Heaven, if you see the director's cut, it's a masterpiece. If you see the the, the one that's out there mostly, it it's a mess. But uh, Ridley Scott's one of his best films is Kingdom of Heaven, if you see how his director's cut um it earns everything in it you, the story is made clear and um and so the so what's happened with lord of the rings is it's rev we're all now enjoying watching longer tales because of lord of the rings and what's happened is things have to align what has in mind in this is that the technologies have changed. I mean, the industrial age when Wagner was doing his stuff was very helpful. People had more money. They had more time to go out and see shows. So, you know, it, it's not, it's an organic thing that's happening in a period. And what has happened since people now enjoy seeing things with their own home, they can get up and take a piss whenever they want. 
come back to it, see a few hours of it. And what's happening is, and this thing is still growing, is that now stories are getting the time that even in the classic movies, they never had to really tell themselves straight out. Lord of the Rings did that. Even though the next thing he did was a mess, uh, the stars aligned with Lord of the Rings in that unique way where everything just fell into place. And it, it's not often repeated. But, oh, what a glorious thing it created. And it set in motion a... Uh, a an interesting kind of thing where you still have all these other kind of movies and things that are a lot a lot of it's just crap and distraction but whenever avatar comes up with a second movie billions watch lord of the rings was one of those moments um avatar one could actually get away with from what 20 2008 or something when that came out or nine and then they had they had James Cameron has the time that Wagner had. He's got 19th century time uh, line here. He's not having to pump it out like suddenly. And remember, Peter Jackson, he he very sage about what went wrong with The Hobbit. He said it was supposed to be Del Toro's movie. And when this stuff happened with problems with New Line Cinema and lawsuits and stuff, it his he had his time ran out. He had to go to go to his other obligations. So Peter tried to save it and jump in. And he when he was in the midst of it, he realized that I didn't get those two years to just take my time just stating what I was going to do in the Lord of the Rings. I mean, he really did. I mean, there's some great footage in those in those ring when you go deeper and deeper into the different programs that show you how they made it. And when they have all these people talking through the movie, all the, the directors and then all the writers. And I mean, I got if there's ever a school of education on writing and doing movies and understanding the difference between the book genre and t television and movies, this, this is absolute collegiate thing. To, I've, I've done it. I've, I learned a lot about my profession by listening to them talk about it. one of the best things as a writer is that they were like saying where do we lead this how do i mean there's so many tales to tales to be told how do we do this even in three movies and then I mean, it was ja jackson's wife who uh who's also very much involved in in the work and writing and she suddenly it just dropped in her head she said follow frodo you know, your writers out there, you understand that if you have a an epic narrative, it's very hard. It's very easy to get lost in a rabbit hole, and especially if you have multiple pathways of narratives. Um, and what she meant by that is that even if there's pathways, they don't stray too far from the fact that this is the the real center of this complex symphonic process is Frodo and Sam, where they're going. Now, that means Bombadil couldn't be in the movie. That's Peter's favorite character. He couldn't ever get Bill Bombadil in it. Even at the end of the, the director's and the writer's part, he said, sorry, Bill, sorry, I couldn't get you in the movie. <laughs> he tried. And, and so this, so, you know, and a lot of people who get to be purists, who just read books, uh, just read the books and hate the movies. And I said, well, that's unfortunate. I used to be that way, but now, now that I've written scripts and write books and, and tell stories, um, there's just, you just cannot tell the whole tale like that, but you can tell a lot more of the tale now, and you can even do it badly like this new rings of power thing. Um, but they're coming back now, you know, not every opera during the Wagnerian period was good. <laughs> You know, so, but people watch them, um, you know, and and so so what I'm seeing is that um, I'm really literally seeing a return with Peter Jackson and James Cameron. What you're seeing is a repeat, a karmic echo of what Wagner started with his ring cycle, which was about the same source stories that Tolkien used uh, later for The Lord of the Rings is about a ring and the ring of power and well, only now it's Valhalla and the gods and it's more Germanic and Scandinavian and um, and there's you know the heroines Brunhilde who uh, the Valkyrie and uh, Sig Sigmund and Sieglinda are this heroic tragic love story um, and they're rebellious their love is like a rebellion against the whole gods and there's a beautiful moment when 
when they've been they're running in high alpines or trying to get away from a gang of people and her husband and and she's run off with Sigmund who she they both discover that they're actually twins the twins so they're they're lovers and twins at the same time so they're really rebellious <laughs> and uh and she uh and they're up in this alpine pass and um and she faints she's kind of gotten tired and she's kind of seeing dogs and that are going to be eating him and he's going to die and and uh and so she falls into this deep sleep and then while he's sitting there with her in his lap out comes Brunhilla who's waiting watching all this and she's now like the Valkyrie in a state of when a Valkyrie announces themselves and so grim and beautiful it means to the warrior oh I'm going to die and she says, see, and she does this whole thing, you know, that your, is your time has come. And because the whole story of the Valkyries is that when Votan wanted to build Valhalla into a fortress against the evil forces that would eventually come after him, the Regnorok, the apocalypse of the uh, Scandinavian lore, um, the idea was he, he went down into the depths of, of, of the earth to make love to Erda and make, I think, eight children from her and the firstborn was Brunhilde the eldest and they grew up to be these these goddesses that are ride horses and battle gear and call through the thunder thunder clouds and come down and they uh, and in, in Viking lore a lot of the people who won a battle might not actually be respected because uh, the idea was that some it's how you die how well you die in a battle because then the valkyries will come they'll take your soul and throw it over the the hilt of the uh hilt of the horse and then fly with their cloud horse to valhalla or uh, you know and valhalla or valhalla as it's called in the in wagner in the german version of it. And so, and these these heroes, these dead heroes, then become the guardians of uh, in the final battle with evil. Um, and so, so, so anyway, he's being Brunhilde's giving. Sigmund says, uh, "says Well, what will I find? Up? Will my father be there?" And she, and she says, "Yes, because he's actually the son of Wotan. He doesn't. He's a he's born of the king of the gods. He doesn't know it." And it says, will there be any women there? And then she says, beautiful things. It'll be Wunschmen mentioned. There'll be these women. And even, even Wotan's doctor, uh, your daughter, will offer you mead. And she's like there, radiant. And, and he goes, um, uh, what, uh, will, will Siglinda be there for? Will she also be there? And she says, Erdenluft, you no, know, she yes yet has to breathe Earth's air. He will not see her there, and so he leans down at her sleeping forehead and kisses it, and then he looks up at her and she says, "So, um, Grusemir, greet me, Velsa, Grusemir, uh, Wotan, Grusemir." And all in hell and all the heroes, Gruz and me, all the wounds nation. And then he says, But I'm not going to Valhalla. I'm staying here. And she's shocked. It's like, I mean, you know, it's, and, and then what he ends up saying is, is, you know, if she, if the one I love cannot be there, then I will I will go to hell with her, and it's really shock shocks us, and she's having quite a crisis. And what eventually happens is, he's he says, "Well, I'm not even going to face that fight." He pulls out now so needful the sword that Votan had left in a tree for him in the house, destined for him to go and pull it out like the sword in the stone. And so he she's still in this magic sleep and then he's taking his sword and said, well, then I'll kill her and kill myself right before you. I'm not even going to give you people the, the, the fight. I'll just kill myself. You know, it's like a decision heroic. Like when life is not working as you, you take the freedom in your rebellion and it might even lead to killing yourself. And so he's going to plunge it in her heart and then he's going to, plunge it in himself and then then suddenly Brunhilde says stay right as long as stop don't and then she says okay I've decided 
I'm going to fight for you. <laughs> She's been ordered by Wotan to make sure that he dies um, because of a whole other story I don't have time to get into. But um, the so she's she's in the scene she sways to his side and so she's going to fight against her father's wishes the war war father this stuff so anyway she goes off and gets prepared and, prepared, and then the the mist starts to come down in the alpine pass and and he looks down and he says soberfest la di la 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 moon and her theme is or sleeping sleeping and then he just says well, it's good that she sleeps and i just sleep my below when you wake and i will be there you know and so then suddenly the horn of hunding is and his henchman he echoes and then he get he puts her down and gets up and grabs his sword and goes running off into the past into the mist and then she starts talking to herself in her sleep uh, remembering a time in the childhood when she's saying, mother, who are those people coming? And this is where she got separated from and taken off by these really gruff people um, and split from, you know, where's the boy? Where's father? And then suddenly the smoke, we can't get out and says, uh, help, help. And then she yells, Sigmund, Sigmund. And suddenly she wakes up in a thunderclap and she goes, Sigmund. And you hear the horns on. And then you hear in the clouds around the rocks, you hear the sound of, Hunding going, Beevold, Beevold. You hear their voices in the, uh, and then suddenly there's a flash of lightning as they're getting ready, and then you see them fighting. And what then happens is you see this red flash of a ghost like figure of Brunhilde and kind of trying to uh, strike him this way, strike him that way. And then, and then suddenly this big light comes in and it's Wotan, and he takes his spear and shatters Sigmund's sword. As he looks at it and he looks up and he gets run through by it sphere and then uh, falls and she screams and Sigmund falls faints and then in the murk Brunhilde finds her and throws her over the hilt of her horse says I got to save you from this and so she the wind catches up the horse starts flying off into the into the murk and the clouds and then the clouds part and there's Wotan behind Hunding as he pulls out his sphere from his son's dead body and and he ends up going gehen knecht free flee for Afrika. that's his wife goddess of marriage who's all pissed off because brother and sister mate ran off uh against her powers and she had to commit votan to changing his plans against his plans he's trying to find create a man a hero of free will from the curse that he's under and so he tried to make kids and do this and but she caught him on this stuff and ended the problem i mean made a made it not possible uh showed where he had a flaw in his theory that he's still trapped so so he had told brunhilde you're going to have to let sigmund fall and of course brunhilde is his wish maiden because you see in the norse a version of votan odin uh, when he was a young god, he came to the great world ash tree to its roots where the Norn, the three Norns of prophecy were sitting be by the brook that, that speaks wisdom, babbles wisdom. And so he wanted to have an edge over the other gods to be king of the gods. And they said, well, then give us your eye. And, and, and it was the eye that's related to the subjective side of your brain. So his sacrifice was that he had lost his intuition, but his intellect gave him the power to win over the other gods and be the king of the gods, but at a great price. That's why Votan's always like this one-eyed guy, because he, he threw it in the water. And then he was he broke a staff off the uh, world ash tree, and he with that tree wrote runes into it and it made it into a spear of his laws, and he holds command over the world through his spear and his laws but he cannot break his own laws so um so it's a he's kind of trapped so he's trying to get some uh, uh, a random element of heroic uh, person which ends up being siegfried uh, out of this which is the child of sigmund and siglinda that's why she survived but anyway um it's a very fast and breathy uh, uh journey through all that but anyway um one of these days i'm going to have to 
think about getting on YouTube if I can deal with the copyright of playing certain music and just literally do my Wagner nights that I usually do sometimes uh, with friends where I um, I take people through the very structure of Wagner's music, teach them the language, the thematic language. This is a whole musical language. It, he's the father of movie scores. When I listen to Howard Shore, uh, he literally, Howard Shore, embraced Wagner's genius in that because I, one of the greatest examples is the, the the beacons, the lighting of the beacons, you know, with all that that builds and builds and then the uh, Gandalf is looking out and Amundine, you know, with that next mountain light and it's just and then he goes out to that beautiful 300 180 degree angle shot that they do where there's these two guys they see the flame and they get up and they start putting the flame in this vastness of this rocky area with a sea of fog as it turns this way and they're waving waving and then that light goes off and it goes oh, da, 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 da. and then suddenly you're teleported over a mountain ridge and you hear the gondor theme oh, da, 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 da. and the strings are doing the flickering of the flames well while it holds the long horns of that and it's going, you see it, and now you see it from the back, and one's lighting after another, it's nighttime, and then finally it ends where here's old um, um, Strider is just sitting there, having his breakfast porridge, and he's just sitting there, and he looks up, and then the, the last beacon at uh, and at Merdicella comes on, and then he just throws its stuff and runs, and he comes into the room and says, the beacons, the beacons have been lit! Condor calls for aid! And King and then looks up, everyone looks up, and then Legolas is like going, what are you going to do, King? Just that look. And he just, he's looking, he looks down at himself, he goes, and, gone, and then Rohan will answer. Ba -ba -dum, ba -ba 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 -ba. That is classic Wagnerian moving, you know, it's, it's so, and it was nice because Howard Shore at the very end of the, if you listen to the director's cut, the final um, Return of the King, they do a real long all, a lot of music that wasn't even used. Um, some of it with Liv Tyler singing, really beautiful stuff. And it's in this long final credits where they're showing all the people who were part of the club or something. It goes on and on forever, all these people, thousands of names. And then finally, when it's ending and all those beautiful sketches of Lee, Lee's sketches, and he, there's this one part where without mentioning him directly he ends it by playing literally right out of Lohengrin the uh, right key right harmonics and so he ended it with a with a Wagner's one of the Wagner's themes from Lohengrin so that was a nice way didn't have to that's a really beautiful way to, to fin the final music is Wagner's music from Lohengrin. <laughs> so, so, and not too many people notice that unless you're a Wagner geek like me, but, um, and, uh, and obviously Howard noticed <laughs> too. Um, he also does incredible mo modern music, like the movie, the cell is, which is this interdimensional weird movie. I mean, he does a little of that with Shelob in the scene where he gets really modern atonal and, so, but yeah, so, so this thing is a thread. This art form is the CGI era where the idea of Gesamtkunstwerk, a total work of art, which has like theater, um, sets, um, motion, music, dance, uh, all the great art forms come together in ensemble. Well, now that is happening with the revolutionary work of James Cameron and his people and in the, in the way they're redefining 3D animation. These are as revolutionary as when Wagner created the sunken uh, orchestra pit. So you can't see the orchestra, but you hear them. That's Wagner did that. And uh, all this, uh, what he did with acoustics in the Bayreuth Feschbield House is well, cutting edge for the time. He actually took the theory into practice. Well, 
James Cameron, who's been fortunate enough to have years to write all the scripts, because Wagner took years to write all the librettos, all the poems, all the words. And he, he spent like three years just writing the four operas and then started the music. Well, here's uh, James Cameron is on a parallel path uh, in, in creating what'll be five more movies. Um, and it's it, Wagner took 25 years to write the 15 hours of music of the four operas of music dramas of the ring and james cameron is on the same path uh, with delays so wagner had an 11 year period where he was writing other things before he came back to act three of siegfried and started finishing that and go to after that the twilight of the gods and and so cameron is on the same parallel karmic path in in an art form which is peak is having its peak of evolving itself and he's taking it beyond where Jackson started. Um, and he's working with Peter because it's all being made at Weta in New Zealand. So it is actually not there. It's Peter is involved. You know, his, his whole revolution is going on, just like Wagner's revolution changed music. He's changing special effects CGI cinema of epics. And the other thing that's happened, thanks to Netflix, and House of Cards, I wrote about as one of my best prophecies. I said, this will become a thing where there'll be an explosion of stories. Everybody will be, it'll be like, like it was in silent movies where there were hundreds of studios. This will, this will happen again. And I, I didn't know it would happen. I just knew, I just, I didn't know how. I just said, this thing is going to take off and make, um, then everybody's going to be making epics and people are going to want it long, you know. Um, the um, the thing that um, HBO did, uh, which is kind of Wagnerian esque, the uh, myth the mythological, the uh, the dragons and all of that. I can't think of the name of it. Um, A A R A R R A R R Martin's uh, epic, um, uh, the, the uh, Thrones Game of Thrones, um, that lasted years. So and people love it long because it's it's not like they have to sit through the whole thing in one sitting they can come back so 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 anyway so this this thing is playing out i think when cameron finishes it it'll probably just start fading again but that's the rock star moment because even though he's gone he's not doing it all the time when these movies come out the whole world watches them and now you know if there's still a world to watch them in that will keep going um, until he's finished all these into the end of the 2020s. Well, I, I have now new new hope in Hollywood. <laughs> well, it's kind of it's, despite Hollywood. I mean, Wagner was despite music of the time and the the mores and right, things. Right. I mean, he once he took he tried to get the Vienna Philharmonic to play uh, Tristan Isolde, his, his most radical work, and. And uh, after, I think, 69 rehearsals, he gave up. They just, it's like what Beethoven used to fight with people. But but I, it's not how I play. I My muscles don't go there. Well, they're going to have to make them go there. For, <laughs> Beethoven would rage. You know, he said, uh, I don't care about your hands. Play it. <laughs> you know? And of course, what happened? Just like I was told when we were designing a book uh, ahead of its time, the Millennium Book of Prophecy is supposed to be like a design of the future where all the all the, the shortnesses of where you read, you only read this far. We made it uh, like computers all across the page. We did stuff that computers would do uh, and, and online. And we were told, you can't do that. People's eyes will hurt. They won't be able to read this way. Well, we're all reading like that. Just like all those instrument people had to learn new fingering. And now the Vienna Philharmonic is the greatest orchestra in the world. But it, it started, he could, they couldn't, you know, I, I only like to listen mostly to the Vienna Philharmonic playing Wagner and Bruckner and Mahler. It's just fantastic sound. Mm -hmm. They're the best orchestra on the planet, or they used to be. I don't know. Things have changed now because that was the other thing that's changed. There was a time in classical music when, you know, there are times when an autocrat is a good thing. A, a conductor where people it's not democratic you're trying to express the conductor's genius and you have the genius to do it 
And in a way, that's happening. David Cameron, he's the boss. Everybody's trying. And Peter Jackson, everybody's. All these brilliant people are not saying, well, I want to be a person. No, they're all working ensemble, but there's one man at or woman at the center of it. And there are times when I think what's happened since when Schulte died, Georg Schulte, and then when von, Herbert von Karajan died, and when Lenny, Leonard Bernstein, fantastic conductor, when these people left us, that was the end that I would have to sadly say that a little too much democracy has now descended upon classical music conductors and their orchestras. And frankly, uh, yeah, maybe people didn't like the fact that you just had to follow Von Carrion. No one plays Bruckner like Von Carrion does. And so, you know, every, it's funny. Uh, we started this long ago, hours ago, about a, a morality or transmoral things that happened where... Um, and there, there are times when a when a dictator is good. If the dictator, if the person is the leader, can really make the orchestra do things that, as a democracy, as a mob, they will never do. And we had them up up through uh, the end of the nineteen nineties, which was an interesting end for a lot of things. You know, in the sixties. Uh, it, it wasn't just rock and roll that was having a revolution. Classical music was having a revolution. All forms of music around the world were, were going through this amazing experimental discovery uh, that the technologies of taping music and filming all started to enhance. So, you know, these cycles come, they go, and they will come again. Well, I think that was we we learned a lot today, and you you definitely have a musical bone in your body. Yep, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> and a so, big musical bonehead. <laughs> so we've we've gotten to the point where we we're near the end of the show, but I want to remind the audience: please click the link to get to John's website, and please subscribe to his periodicals, and um, and sign up for a reading. Uh, I've done the reading. It's uh, you'll learn a lot about yourself, and it's it's fun. It's you know, and um, but uh, you know, please click the link, go to the website, and help John out so he can provide information that uh, that's enjoyable, and uh, you learn something about maybe yourself and and you know, about the world around you. Uh, like you know, perfect example, John. You know, there were things that you revealed today at the beginning of the show that I had no idea you know, especially with your father and that dynamic between you and your father. I didn't know that. So, um, you know, and I, I think that there are probably many people in America um, and around the world because, you know, this is not just broadcast to, you know, to, to just American audience, but uh, I bet there are a lot of families that, um, that have a similar kind of dynamic that's going on. And, you know, they, yes. they all have their own way of trying to deal with it. Maybe they can learn from what happened in, in your situation. Well, this comes up in in my readings, you know, so, uh, ways to deal with uh, a lot of the clients go, and it's it's done really in a loving way, and <laughs> nobody's naked bouncing off the walls like I was in India. It's it's a little more civilized, <laughs> just uh, and you know, it, it, we all do this. We all do the best we can. And uh, and ultimately, what would be very beautiful is if we can rediscover our lost innocence, because that is the Buddha. And it can be rediscovered. You cannot lose. You cannot. You can forget it or be programmed by an ego coating to forget it. But you, it is you, and it's hard to discover it because you are it. So all the seeking is actually, all the effort is actually useless. What has to happen is an, a knack of relaxing in the here and now and acceptance of things as they are and how they go. And what then simply watches is the innocent being that is emerging from the veils.
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that, well, let's leave it at that. But thank you very, thank you very much, John, for being on the show. And uh, obviously, we'll do this uh, again soon. And again, the audience, please click the link. It'll take you to John's website, and please sign up for his periodicals and for the readings. So you you have to wave bye bye to everybody. <laughs> bye bye, or as they say in Russia, poka poka. <laughs> Poka, poka, poka. Poka, poka. All right. I learned that from it. watching. I'm a, I'm a, I'm an absolute fan of Luna the Pantera. Uh, this couple that have a panther named Luna or Boopka. Watch it every day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Let me stop the recording here. <laughs>